you're recording. Okay. Uh, hi, how are you today? Very good, thank you. Um, my name's Kerry King, and I'm going to be uh, discussing with you your military background today. Uh, today is February the 2nd, 2015. We're at the Atlanta History Center, and I believe you are Jewel A. Meyer Bachman. Is that correct? Bachman was the maiden name, that's right. Okay, so Bachman was your maiden name. Right. All right, and if you would tell us, uh, just start wherever you want, but uh, we're interested today in your telling us about your military background and, and your background before and after the military. So please feel free to start wherever you're comfortable. Well, I guess starting with birth, Buffalo, New York, and it was the coldest day in Buffalo history right to this day, minus 21. <laughs> and I always smile because they went to the hospital with a car with no heater. <laughs> but that was February 9th, 1934, and I'm the eldest of three daughters, uh, city girls. We lived in the city because my father worked with the Buffalo Fire Department 43 years, started and retired there at the top of the ranks, and um, so we had to live in the city. I'd say we were a conservative Christian family, and I say that because we went to church faithfully, prayed faithfully, but we had chores and rules and expectations that a lot of people thought were harsh, but basically it was to do our very best, whatever our best was. Um, we were expected to help neighbors, uh, even seven and eight years old, I remember shoveling snow for neighbors because one was a mailman. My father said, he's been on his feet all day, what have you been doing? So it was our little kid shovels, we'd do our best at that. Uh, mother was a homemaker, typical for the time, but she was a, a very experienced seamstress, made most all our clothes, many times taking apart an uncle's coat or something and transforming it. But she also was a vocalist who liked to whistle and got involved with the PTA and church and did quite a bit of this musical stuff. I think they were both supermodels to grow up with. Um, when I started thinking about military, December 7th, 41 is what came to mind. I was probably seven, and we were sitting around as a family to listen to a radio show called The Shadow. It was an every Sunday thing. I remember it very well. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, I remember hearing voices out on the street calling out, and they were, we were told newsboys, and they were announcing that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And, Life changed for all of us at that point. Um, the other memory I have because of that it was the harshness of it in some ways to us as children because my sister and I were in first and second grade and typical of war and isolation, our name was German. People knew you were German the other gen next generation still spoke it and we got a lot of Heil Hitlers and Nazis as name calling. But it was not just us, there were Jewish kids in the neighborhood that got called things and the Italian families did. Mm -hmm. So all of us survived it and I guess it made us stronger people but it wasn't something that I liked. Sure. Um, family, we had three cousins that served in the military, all of them in the European theater. One died over there, one was a POW, and the third one came home with the POW at the same time. So there were gold stars in the family. And but they, and, and just for, so everyone that may watch this knows, a gold star is a parent who has lost a child right. in a combat situation. So it's this one um, time. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's I didn't okay. You. Um, I graduated high school in June of 52, uh, honors, and had a partial scholarship to college and not enough family money to supplement it. And that's where the thoughts of going in military arise. I met a girl who was an Air Force recruiter in Olean, New York, and talked to her about it and was pretty much decided I was going to join the Air Force. And when I came home, two girlfriends said, oh, I'd like to do that, but I like the Navy uniform better. So we ended up all three going to the Navy. But before that, my father said to me, 
you're going to have to give me 10 good reasons because at 18 I needed a signature. Sure. And he got 10 reasons. I couldn't tell you what they were. I don't know if they sold him, but he gave his blessing and he did sign. So two of the girls went to Dubois, Pennsylvania and, you know, got tested in. We went to Pittsburgh uh, for our swearing in, met up with the other girl from Buffalo, New York, and we all went to Bainbridge, Maryland, and we're in Company 81 at boot camp. There were three companies going through at the same time. After that, oh, I'm going to back up, because with Daddy signing for me to go, he also gave what I call a two wisdoms. And one was that uh, if you're asked to dig a ditch or clean toilets or whatever, do better than anybody else. And the second thing was that um, a uniform is a form of ID. So you must be a good example. And I'm sure I never disappointed him or the Navy either. But th that proved to me to be very good advice. I would hope those are still values in yeah. this country, both of those but, things. But then, if you didn't balk and you wore a smile, you, you went a lot farther and you were a lot happier. <laughs> and uh, the example, I'll tell you a story a little later on that'll help you understand about that. Um, while we were in boot camp, they early weeks, they tried different people out for company jobs. I got to try out for company commander, and I did not get it. And I'm sure the reason was a good one. Uh, company commander was the one who would say the smoking lamp is on. So then someone who smoked could, could smoke, and those were very precious times. I didn't smoke, so I never thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> and they found a good company commander who did. <laughs> the other job I tried for was mail clerk, and I became the company mail clerk. So did you, did you go through the same type of basic training that the mail uh, enlistees went through? Everything, as far as I know, but shooting. Um, we had to climb up high on a ship in, in a swimming pool area and go through the same jumping and all, and use our jeans, tie a knot in them to make buoyancy. Uh, we had to go through a building that was all smoke filled and, you know, crawling to get through, but no shooting, the waves did not shoot. Okay, and did they, uh, if you, when you say you didn't shoot, you mean you didn't have to go through an obstacle course where they were shooting over your head or anything no, like that? Nothing was. And weapon. you were not issued a weapon either? Mm -mm. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. We didn't know that when we went in, but uh -huh. <laughs> that was the only branch of service at the time that that was true of. And for those of us that aren't in our generation, a uh, wave, what, what did the terminology wave stand for? W women accepted for volunteer emergency service. Very good. And they Thank don't you. use that expression anymore. Uh, Women's Memorial talked to me about a month ago, and the girl said, do you care if I change waves to U.S. Navy? And I said, well, it always was U.S. Navy, but she explained that now it's just one. There's sailors, female and male. There are not women accepted. Political uh, correctness, I suppose. Right, probably. Okay. But it, it didn't matter. They understood what it was. Okay. Um, in boot camp, I said my, my classes I enjoyed. The one was favorite probably was naval history. I liked the information that came out of it, but I had a petty officer as a teacher. Could have taught anybody anything. I've never seen anybody with so much enthusiasm and just zest for what she was teaching. And uh, the other things that were my favorites were marching and drill. And we did a lot of, I call it game playing at the end of each time frame class. They'd play uh, a game like Simon Says, and the whole company would start out, or three companies would, and they would give commands. And you know being in the military, if you hear a command, you're trained to respond. So to 
pick up on Simon Says and know which command you're going to follow. Mm -hmm. People run, running into each other on right turns when they shouldn't have and what have you. The idea was to see who knew their drill commands to stay into the very end. So it got to be quite a competition to see if you could. I, I didn't every time, but I did make it a few times. <laughs> and you know, you really tried hard to be in that group. Um, we graduated uh, with families coming to see parade and all. And where was your boot camp? Bainbridge, Maryland. Okay. And when was, can, do you recall when that would have been, what time uh, of the year? October 52 through probably mid-December of that year. Okay. And my first orders following two weeks leave at Christmas time that year was to report to the U.S. Naval Station at San Diego, California. And it ended up to be a weight assignment because I was to go to communication school but needed clearance and clearance didn't come for several weeks. Uh, it turned out my mother's sister was married to a British serviceman who was now serving in Hong Kong. So between the distance to where they were and what he was doing, it took a while, I guess, to satisfactorily mm -hmm. I could be there even with a foreign national in the family. Then once I was cleared, I was set, transferred down to the Naval Radio Station at Imperial Beach, California, and started communication school. And that Where is Imperial Beach? Almost to the Mexican border. Down in the Baja? Yeah, it's where the strand comes into the mainland and um, you know, Coronado Island. So you're almost at the border. And um, we were in school then from February until August of that year. I have a picture I can show you later, but it was an all-female class, and the Navy said, the one and only, they would never do that again. <laughs> we were a bad group, I guess, <laughs> mischief makers. <laughs> but uh, we did all graduate in August of 53. Uh, <clears throat> were your instructors um, female or male? Or male. both? Male? Male. And that was probably the problem. We gave the poor, <laughs> poor petty officer a bad time. <laughs> But it was good. And after school, I, I say briefly envied because I had orders to Wahiawa, Hawaii, and then had a medical waiver come up and was reassigned to the Naval Radio Station at Imperial Beach for regular duty assignment. It meant changing barracks and going to a different area of the base. But <clears throat> I said I didn't win friends and influence people because when I went, I was the first female reporting for duty. And apparently, they called all of the guys in for an 8 o'clock meeting, whether they'd worked midnight to 8 or on their day off or whatever. And the gist of the meeting was, you can't take your middies off, you don't swear, do this, can't do that. So they really kind of disliked the fact that this wave was coming. <laughs> And when I got there, junior person made coffee. I didn't drink it, didn't know how to make it. You were supposed to do the mail run. I didn't drive. You were supposed to do the burn detail, and it required wearing a weapon and no knowledge. So someone volunteered to teach me how to drive, and somebody took me out on the weaponry range when others were qualifying, and I did learn to qualify on a 38 and a 45 and had to carry to do the mail run. And um, I learned to make coffee and I drink it now. <laughs> but you there, can't be in the service and not, and not either drink or learn how to make coffee, one <laughs> of the two. That's true. But uh, that's what broke the ice, the fact that Dad had said to me, do the best you can and if you'll show me, I can do it. And I've got people from that group that are still real good friends. And so was that the beginning of your coffee drinking career in the Navy? I don't know that I did then. <laughs> I probably longer on down the line, but uh, they got theirs and they were happy. So. <laughs> and this doing the mail run to San Diego 11th Naval District was what we were doing. 
Again, people down there were not used to seeing a woman with a weapon. And uh, you were Marine Tony, so you know their trouble. But <laughs> when I would get out of my truck or my van to walk to the building, you'd get this <laughs> <laughs> And that gun on your hip tends to do this anyhow, so <laughs> one thing provoked another. <laughs> and at one point, and I wish I had a copy of that, they had an 11th district newspaper and someone took a picture and I, nothing written up because they didn't talk to me about it, but the heading was Pistol Pack and Mama. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, it was a novelty and an unusual thing uh, then and there. But uh, after that assignment, um, I got transferred to Washington, D.C. You never got to Hawaii? No. Never no, I, I stayed at the Naval District in San Diego for medical care. Um, I don't know if you want it on there, but sure, at 19, you... I stopped having menstrual periods. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is not right. You knew mm -hmm. it, and I knew I wasn't pregnant. So when I went to the gynecology department, I had eight doctors and they did all kinds of biopsy testing and one thing and another. What it turned out to be briefly is the endocrine system was out of balance and they explained it to me. It's like a car with gears and if it meshes and what breaks off one of the gears, they'll all slip and slide. And that's kind of what was happening. So I was basically in the throes or the start of menopause at 19. They were miracle workers because they got to the bottom of it and I had my first child. I was just going to say, it sounds like they fixed it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I would feel about being compared to a car, however. Um, well, it explained it clearly because I did understand gears and how you know the teeth uh -huh. work to make something go around. So yeah. it, it was helpful for that. So how long did you stay in San Diego with the, with the mail clerk's job? Um, probably from August of 53 until April of 54. Okay, and then you said, you were about to tell me, I think when we interrupted or you went, uh, you were telling us about the hospital. Um, you went to Washington, you got orders to Washington, right. D.C.? That was my last assignment. I went in April of 54 and was discharged in October of 56 from that area. So you were there about two and a half years. Uh -huh. And what exactly, what did you do in Washington, D.C.? What was your job? Lots of or different jobs? things. Hmm. I lived at Quarters K, which was just a barracks for all the naval personnel in that area in Arlington, Virginia. And my first duty station was at a NASA location. At the time, I probably wouldn't even have told you that because we didn't discuss it. We got on the bus, we got dropped off, we came home. But since it's been on TV now, I guess mm -hmm. NASA, NSA is not off limits. Um, I was on rotating shifts, eight on, eight off, and found out that People don't always sleep in the daytime, me being one. And the more I tried to catch sleep, I'd miss meals. One thing led to another, and I got sick and ended up in sick bay. And I don't know if it was nerves or what, but a psychiatrist that came in to talk to me about why was I trying to get out of the job or whatever <laughs> decided that it was really sleep and sickness, and I got transferred. Um, I call it my rabbit experience because where they transferred me, I had observed what you probably would have called troublemakers. We're going to get rid of you. You're going to the Pentagon, that group. And I got sent to that group and I thought, well, we'll find out what this is like. And uh, the briar rabbit is throw me in the briar patch and it was his escape. It was mine. It was the best duty assignment you probably could have had. <laughs> And the people there, again, because I had a good attitude, found something they hadn't been getting, and everything was different for me there. Um, Were you the working for higher-ranking uh, naval officers, or? 
with all naval officers and civilians in that that assignment. Okay. So this would be part of the Department of the Navy in the Pentagon? Um, here goes your, define it. The assignment was OPNAV slash DNI. And I believe it's Naval Operations Director of Naval Intelligence. It was my mm -hmm. top group. But um, th this was a, a group of people that had probably traveled all around the world, especially the civilians. Many of them had been in embassies, that kind of assignment. Uh, I can't think of any one of them that didn't speak multiple language. Uh, just brilliant people, very, very good to work around, very good at sharing and teaching. Um, my duties at that point uh, involved teletype, courier duty within the Pentagon, uh, tape processing for code, coding and decoding. And, um, so have you seen the imitation game about the Enigma yes, machine? Yes, I have. What did you think? I liked it, and I thought that really made you think because you'd seen coding and decoding equipment, but uh, to realize how important they were at the time. Mm -hmm. I found it fascinating, the movie. Yeah. I, I thought um, I didn't know much about Enigma when I saw the movie. And I was very impressed. He invented literally what became the first computer. Probably. Brief. Anyway, that we got off subject. So no, it was a good movie, and I thought realistic what they struggled to go through and the minuscule time frames that they had to try and accomplish something. In. So when you said you were a courier in the Pentagon, you meant you took messages from one department to another within right. the Pentagon right. system. Um, the one time, uh, I think his name was Gary Powers, but anyhow, there was a plane shot down. That's and right. That and was you one too. Of, yeah, you too. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those things that would have been an instant courier. I mean, multiple people going in multiple places. Mm -hmm. Because once it w the message was and decoded, it would have been printed up and then had to go to wherever. Sometimes I saw the things I delivered, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I encoded or decoded, but you never knew who was going to do it. But that was the kind of courier stuff you were what doing. What was your security clearance at that time? I think it was called Eyes Only. I think later they ended up calling that top secret crypto. Probably. I know there was top secret, and my husband has said that to me several times. Well, I had top secret, and I said, really? I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. what difference does it make? You, yeah. you had what you had, and when you say eyes only, you could have worked at the next cubicle and not ever seen what I did. And same for me. Uh -huh. that, that's the way our group was. Yeah, we, um, I, I think the, the military later changed, changed that terminology to top secret, and if you were really top notch, you were top secret crypto, which meant you could do what you did. And, yeah, that, that could be. I don't um, know. So you enjoyed the Burr Rabbit job then at the, I, at the Pentagon? I loved it. When we got down, one of the questions was uh, your feelings when you left. Very mixed, very mixed feelings because I did like the job and I liked the group. And at the time, I was dating one of the officers in the group. We weren't supposed to be, and we'd managed to keep it so nobody knew until I was going out. And that was kind of the reason. Um, he was going to Japan, and I was headed toward Europe, more than likely. And it's like, you need to be in one place so I know where you are sort of thing, and you can go back to college. Well, we broke up probably... 15, 12, 15 months later. Yeah. He decided to go to medical school and was not going to be able to have a, a wife while. And I sort of said something <laughs> colorful or get off the pot. <laughs> you said, I'm not waiting eight years yeah. for you to finish medical school. That's about it. So, um, I, If you don't mind me asking a little, um, just kind of, a, a, kind of an open-ended question, but 
How do you feel about, there's been a lot of conversation about women in the military in general nowadays, and about women specifically in combat-related roles. I mean, what do you feel about that? Uh, I'm probably not in favor of it. Uh, the groups I was in, you could have been overseas in an area that might have been questionable, maybe not necessarily war, but again, in school even, you were told you may have to burn, destroy, and you may even have a pill in case. Now, how seriously that would have been, I don't know. But that part in school, I debated many days, do I want to finish school? Because I don't know if I'm up to that. Mm -hmm. I, can, and I can understand that. Knowing about today even, all the college rape and drinking, and they're not even living in close quarters, I, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. And, you know, um, they're also, speaking of that, there have been a lot of uh, women in the military who have now raised allegations of sexual yeah. abuse. I mean, did you, did you experience any of that when you were in the military? I, I never did. I, I honestly feel my demeanor or deportment probably pre precluded it. I never used colorful language. I always presented immaculate appearance. They didn't laugh at jokes. I mean, the guys might tell them, but they were never directed at me. So no, I feel more like the, the people I worked with were like big brothers watching over me more than anything else. So they were basically respectful to you as a woman. Very much so. Uh, and treated you like a lady. Um, I sometimes wonder if, if it's not just the culture itself and, and what's happened, but um, I was just curious of that. So when you, when you went into the military, when you went into the Navy, uh, was it post-Korean War? No, it was Korean. Okay, and how did that affect or impact uh, the work you were doing? I can't say that I was aware of anything really connected with it, just that you were part of the troops, the whole service group that were involved in it. Even when you were in the Pentagon, did it have any effect, uh, any of the messages you oh, dealing sure, with relate to I'm troop sure movements and things like that? Stuff, yeah. yeah. Did you, you're watching, um, like they, they told about a, a, even in Enigma, troop movements, uh, who was here, what was where, and I think in the one scene when they finally cracked it, they'd faked it because they didn't want the Germans to know that they did know what was going on. Yeah. So yeah, there yeah. were things like that that you, you knew. I mean, there were, um, when you talk about security clearances, there was a point at which I was an intelligence, I don't know if I was intelligent, but I was an intelligence officer in charge of uh, the intelligence for a particular brigade, a combat brigade, and we had a little group of people that were in a trailer and they used to bring me over messages and when I would ask them where they were getting this information, they refused to tell me. Yeah. 40 years later, I've <coughs> since found out that they were doing radio intersection. Did you ever do anything like that? I didn't, but we, um, in school, part of our training was Morse code and that was the idea that you were supposed to, I could never relax enough to just go with it and you have to be able to. I was always trying to do the dot, dot, dit, dit, and I got up to 14, 16 words a minute. Doesn't cut it, doesn't <laughs> cut it. I mean, when they're doing it with the little hand side ones, there are 25 or more, and I know some of the fellows I worked with, it took to it just like that. And a couple of the girls did, but it, it's a thing that kept me from promoting for a while because, um, communication technician, which I was, you were required to know the Morse code as well as. I knew all the as well as, and even on the one test was in the top five fleet-wide exam. And it bothered my bosses that I didn't get promoted, but I could not successfully Damn get Morse through Morse. Tried, I used to stay after work when I was on day shift, spend a couple hours listening, and finally decided can't do it. I'm not going to promote. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> now, I noticed you were in four years. Yes. 
And was that the term of your enlistment, four years? Uh-huh. Did you consider it all staying in after four years? I did for a while. As I said, it was the, the dating that kind of changed that. Yeah. Uh, so the, the officer you were dating getting shipped to Japan and all that. So you at some point made the decision to get out of the Navy, obviously. Mm -hmm. And where did you go when you got out of the Navy? Did you go back to Buffalo or? Yes, I did. Um, I took a trip through New England, uh, had my first car, and drove up and met my sister in um, New York City area. And then she and I drove up the coast. I'd written it down. But anyhow, we went up as far as uh, Maine and then headed back down across the New York Thruway to home. But. Um, and did you, what did you do when you got to Buffalo? Did you go to, go to college? Did you, what did, tried what did you? To f tried to find a job. Um, didn't happen right away, but. Uh, registered for college at Millard Fillmore College at the University of Buffalo. Um, when I got a job, I was working the days at an insurance company and then going to college at night, uh, taking science courses and leading to physical therapy is what I had hoped. Uh, when you finish two years, you had to go days because many of the classes were in conjunction with the hospital or like you're interning with it. And by that point, the insurance company had offered me a job in medical underwriting. And it was one of these. And I chose the insurance company and went with that. No regrets because, I, again, I loved the job. I uh, worked with medic, two medical doctors at the company and in addition to underwriting risk for the company, uh -huh. became the policy uh, supervisor, issue supervisor. Oh, so you were one of those people I argued with all the time <laughs> on the phone. Okay, so um, did you did you follow through with that career? Did you stay in the insurance business? Or? I did until I got married and was pregnant with my first child. Yeah, and and did you, were you in Buffalo until you got married? Mm-hmm. Did you meet your husband in Buffalo? Yes, he graduated the University of Michigan and came to the Buffalo area to work with Bell Aerospace, and we met at a church young adult fellowship. Uh -huh. And when did you get married? What year mm -hmm. was that? <laughs> March 19th of 1966. Mm -hmm. We started something that year. There were seven couples in this fellowship group that got married. So I think wow. we were, we Must were the first. Must have the water, huh? Yeah, we were yeah. the first ones that year, but it was quite a group. So. So um, when you got out of the military, did you ever look back and regret that you had gotten out of the Navy? I don't, I don't re remember regrets. I went back in again, so. Oh, you did? Well, tell us about that. <laughs> well, then. while I was working at the insurance company, one of my bosses there uh, was a commander at the reserve station in Buffalo. And he said to me one day, you know, I've got these recruits then they can't promote. And apparently they were, he was speaking of all women. And they'd been in the unit for a while, longer than he thought they should be and not move up to seaman apprentice. And he kept saying to me, you could come down there and we could, we could work something out, you know, all these. Well, the thing finally ended up, if I were to be able to get you chief petty officer, jumping from second class to chief, after you took your tests and studied, would you consider doing this? And I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder if you really can do that. So, in any event, he won out, and I went down to the group, and I served almost two years there, and got out because of the child's pregnancy. As a chief petty officer, is that an E7, seven, seven. E8, E7? Yeah. So I went from five to seven. Oh. From active duty five to. Reserve seven. Oh, very good. And where were you? Where were you doing your reserve duty? Right at Buffalo. Oh. Week weekends, and uh, the girls in that group. If I remember right, there were seven of them, and four did manage to move up to seaman apprentice. So whether I helped them or 
Apparently you know, just you did. the exposure of things or explaining, because I had my Blue Jackets manual and there were a lot of things in there they could look up and maybe they understood them better than somebody just do this, do this, I don't know, but. <laughs> well, that's good, sounds like it worked. But that qualified me, I found out recently, for a star on my, what's the National Defense, because that was considered Vietnam service time. Oh. Surprised me, but. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, so that was your last uh, period of duty with the Navy that, that two years before your uh, first child was born? Mm-hmm. And um, how many children do you have? Two. Seven pregnancies and two children. Well. So as I said, I, I feel like the medical care in the, in the Navy definitely uh, provided that pathway, but still with some difficulty. <laughs> Were you, when you were going to school, were you going under the GI Bill? Did they pay for yes. it? Yes. Did. Yeah. So you know you may still actually have some benefits out there if you look into them. You yeah, know? I've been told I probably do, but I have not I have not really decided ever to go back. And mm -hmm. I think along the way, you never stop learning. So whether it was formal degree or otherwise, it, it's ongoing. And when I was at the insurance company, they had a series of tests, LOMA, I think it was Life Office Management Association, but mm -hmm. that was a standard to put behind, behind your name. And I studied by myself and passed all four of them. So it's like, if it helps what you're doing, you learn about it, that, that sort yeah. of thing. I remember my father telling me he had to drop out of school during the Depression in 1933, so they needed all the boys to work, so he had to go to work and never got to college. And But he read three to four books a week and was very much a self-educated man, so mm -hmm. I, I totally identify with what you're saying. So how long did you <coughs> stay in Buffalo? We, we got married there and raised our family there, let's see, 66 to... 1978, and my husband lost his job at Bell Aerospace, and then when he found work again, it was in Columbus, Ohio. So it's 78 to 83, we were in Columbus, Ohio. And starting in 82 and going to about 84, they moved the company from Columbus down to Duluth, Georgia. And if you wanted to stay with the company, you moved. <laughs> So, so here moved. we are. So you moved. <laughs> and many of the people were almost retirement age. To them it was, look at this, they're going to send me <laughs> south to retire. <laughs> so. so like the swallows to Capistrano. Yeah. So you've been here since 83. Some, 83. And uh, you like it down here in the south? Yeah. yeah. Obviously you do. You've been here a long time. Yeah. Got um, a good start here because uh, I had been in a group in Columbus, Ohio called New Neighbors League. And you can only be active two years while you are a new neighbor. And I became president there and became new neighbor of the year in Columbus. And then when I came down here, I transferred my membership and repeated it here. Mm -hmm. President and new neighbor of the year. So. Well, I, interestingly, I think the the role of women in the military has dramatically changed since you were in. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, what what do you? How do you? When you read about it, and you have you talked to any women that are in the military uh, now? Yeah, now, I'm happy for them because I think they were restricted uh, from promotion because of the limitations. And really and truly, maybe other than on the battlefield, because I told you I have mixed feelings mm -hmm. about it, I feel they're equally capable. And I'm not a member of the National Organization for Women. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, just by observation. There's a lot of brilliant people and dedicated people, and I'd like to see them go full bloom. It seems to me there are, uh, I know the Army has some female generals. Um, I'm 
pretty sure the Navy has yes, some admirals. admirals. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force certainly does <laughs> as well. I'm not sure about the Marine Corps, but um, are there? Um, the, it, it seems that the big debate right now is about women in combat. And specifically, I know that the Marine Corps tried an experiment with allowing women to participate in the platoon leaders class, the PLC program. And to my knowledge, it didn't go very well. Um, they got down to two women. I don't think they were able to complete the physical part of the test. I mean, what, do you have any thoughts about that as to whether or not that's even something that they ought to be targeting or looking for? I don't know, because I honestly can't think of any women I know that could pass, like the SEAL training, mm -hmm. Ranger training. There really are requirements that are, I think, beyond our muscular or bone structure. That's my opinion, but. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're here to find out, yeah. your opinion. I, so. I was always very athletic, and, mm -hmm. and there are still things that I can't, I can't do mm -hmm. to the number they might want you or need you to do. <clears throat> and so, you know, small boned, whatever, I, I really don't picture myself succeeding in some of those. Mm -hmm. I might have tried, given a good shot, but still well, I, known there were limitations. It would occur to me <clears throat> that there are women who are, I believe, strong enough and to handle a great many, at least the basic training requirements. I think there are women probably that could get through special ops and, and uh, special forces training and even, maybe even SEAL training. The question is whether or not that's, that's desirable or it should be. Is I have four daughters and a son, and the question is whether or not one of my daughters wanted to do that, how I would feel about it. I don't know. I don't know. So you brought some memorabilia for us to look at, I understand, and we'd love to see it. Tell us what you got for us. Well, this is the first thing I brought <clears throat> because it's a typical anchor with a fouled uh, wire. But this was given to a team I bowled on in the Navy, five women, uh, 1956, and we were all Navy first place champions. So oh, very good. That's, my, that's the only bowling trophy I've kept. I've donated all the other ones to youth groups who wanted to re relabel them. You still bowl? No. Stop bowling. Stop huh? bowling. So that, that trophy is all Navy? Wow. It's impressive. Yeah. We were we were competing <clears throat> for Eastern Command, all Navy, so it was like wherever their na naval bases along su submitted team. Well, maybe we need to reconsider our thoughts about Navy SEALs then, if you could win the all Navy <laughs> bowling team. Uh, well, I said I brought with me my original gloves from boot camp, and it's pretty faded, but we had to write our name in every item of clothing, and mine mm -hmm. still very, very briefly show Bachman, J.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dog tags from the original enlistment. And my grandsons would like to have them because apparently they're fashionable jewelry right now. I didn't know boys, but <laughs> they thought they'd like them. And, uh, this, of course, because it was my chief petty officer, lapel. Wow. Very nice. And the hat was the original Navy hat from boot camp, but this part had to be added on when I made chief. So no change in size or anything, but the chief is a black, so that part had to. I say. To change. So is this uh, similar to the current Navy uniform the, the for the women's is, yeah. Navy uniform? Yeah. The, is it this the same? This would be hat? dress dress yeah. able, uh -huh. or dress baker. I'm sorry, able is full black top. So you had both the blue <laughs> uniform and a white. Did you have a white uniform also? And this was uh, during during Korea. We had uh, suits that were this sort oh, really? of pinstripe. We would call now I don't think they so have utilities. that at all. They they pretty much, I think the khakis or even fatigues like. Uh -huh. So then this would just be dress. Now, did you have any uniforms that had 
pants or were they all skirts? And no, I, I we had navy navy blue wool slacks, and when I did burn burn detail, I had uh, denim dungarees. <laughs> <laughs> So this um, was our yearbook from boot camp, so that I keep because there's a lot of memories in it. But um, I brought my ID from when I was um, in the reserve, and this is a page out of the Women's Memorial. Uh, what's written up. If you go to Washington, D.C., you can look me up, and this is what you'd find on that page. And that was a photo from when I was in Washington, when I first got there. It was taken in Washington. I see. And this is that all-female group of eight, and they have all written things on it. I didn't read it before. I just noticed it now, so maybe I Could should. You turn the back with the with the centers on, so the camera can get a good shot of it. Yeah, see it. Yeah, that's terrific. So everybody in the class signed the back of the photograph. Yeah, it looks like. I heard you say earlier you communicated with one of the ladies that was in the Navy with you. Do you communicate with any of the others? Um, two, the two, two girls that were best friends that I went in with, um, as recently as Christmas with the one, uh, she lives in South Carolina with her husband, uh, married a medic when they were both medics. Mm -hmm. And I just found out at Christmas she's struggling with cancer and not not a good time right now. And the other girl I last saw probably about 18, 20 months ago, her husband called me and said, could I come to the Wingate Inn in Norcross and meet with Barbie? And I thought, gee, it's funny she didn't call. But as we conversed, I realized that dementia was in its early stages. And I think oh. that's why I have not heard from her. Uh, Christmas, we always wrote. And so I, husband's probably got his hands full with other yeah. things. And that was my mail orderly badge in boot camp and the instructions on how I was to do my job. Now, the badge that you the badge of rank you just show, uh, held up. What is that uh, E5, E6? It was just in boot camp. That's in boot camp? Yeah. Okay. Co company commander had what looked like the, the three rocker, like a chief, mm -hmm. and uh, mail already was this. And I know there was somebody that had like a first class, but I don't remember what their so title was. you were like was. an E1 or an E2 when you mm -hmm. wore that? No. Still a seaman recruit, still just a with seaman a fancy. Recruit. Okay. <laughs> There's pictures in the book here. Um, where you can see that badge on somebody's arm, if I can find one of them. But is there a picture of you in there? Oh yeah. The middle one here in the top row. Get my hand out of there. Uh, so I thought if there were some with uh, drill pictures, and then you could see, yeah. Now, we're, we're all in boot camp in this one, but if you can show it in the thing, you'll see arm badges. See. Those mm -hmm. would have been recruits that were company officers. Mm -hmm. And I'm in that picture, too. That would be me in the second row. I see. Very nice. And these were another uniform that we had back then because the girls had dresses and in boot camp. We had to wear them sometimes, too. You may have told us this, but what cost you to pick the Navy instead of the Army or the Air Force? The other two girls liked the uniform better. <laughs> Pure vanity. And it meant an extra year's service because Air Force was only three. But as I said, when you're bosom buddies and you're all going to do it, sure. Well, I have to agree with them. The uniforms were better in the <laughs> Navy for the women. I agree. Well, that, that was the reasoning behind it anyhow. So how many grandchildren do you have? Two boys. Two boys. Two boys. And they are, their ages are? They're about to turn 13 and 15 oh. in April. So. And they live here in this area? Uh -huh. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, 
Is there anything else you'd like to talk to us about, about your military service or show us? No, I don't think so. Oh, these were <laughs> yellowed, as you can see. Mm -hmm. But when you were in boot camp, did you march, did you sing? Yes. Th these were our Navy songs. Uh, yeah. And you never went any place but what you were singing. And some were favorites and some, you know, they were called out and you had to do them. But it sure did pass the time and make <laughs> it go faster when you had a lot of marching or walking to do. Oh, that's another thing that. I don't know if you can read it from there. It's the verbal alphabet that was part of the oh. first learning for communication. As an Abel Baker. Yeah. And so forth. Yeah. And this was our uh, graduation program for the family more than us. But it was typical of Bainbridge, if you can see the marching units. And each uh, Saturday, some company graduated. and male or female, and ours was female, of course, all female. Were you in a separate area of the base from where the male uh, yeah. trainees were? Not completely removed from them because Friday nights, I think it was Friday night, they used to have dances and uh, would bus whoever was eligible to go to the dances, and that was a lot of fun. And I presume that this is a part of your past that you uh, look back on with pleasure, that it yeah. was a part you enjoyed. Something you'd asked in your questions, I think, was about what reactions did you get when you, you came home. I think it was true then, and it is still today, almost like celebrity. Um, I never knew anybody that was. What was it like? And one thing that girls will ask, then and still now. How'd you like wearing a uniform? Same thing every day and looking like everybody else. And I thought it really made it easy because someone announced in boot camp on the PA, uniform of the day is, and you knew if it was A, B, whatever, what to put on and there was no question. You could get dressed real quick. And I, I've learned since to lay out my clothing the night before. Sometimes you change your mind, but it's ready to go if I have to go quick. Well, see, for a man, I can tell you, I was glad somebody picked out what I had to wear and then I didn't have to worry about it after that. <laughs> and, and I knew the same thing. I was going to be in the same thing every day. I didn't have to worry about being in or out of fashion because everybody else had on the same thing. Yeah. I, my wife said the only, the only way you know men, the difference between men and women, is to go to a gala affair because the men only feel comfortable if they all have exactly the same black tuxedo with a white shirt and a bow tie, and the women are only comfortable if they all have on something different. That's probably so, true. Yeah. That's probably true. So um, <clears throat> is, there, is there anything else you would like to tell us at all, either about your military service or just about just looking back, any, any sort of uh, summary or anything you got out of this, how you would recommend it to, to young women coming up to either go in the service or not? I mean, what are your feelings about that? I don't know that I'd recommend it to them unless I felt they were adaptable, because you definitely have to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you can be, I thought it was the best experience of my life. I think my family upbringing was a good foundation, and I thank my parents for that. But I, my military, I feel, was just a broadening of that. All mm -hmm. good memories. Except for one, because I put that as my last line. The only negative that I could ever connect was military. And I told Tony I thought, I thought about it. But one day, it was pouring down rain. I always walked from Quarters K to the Pentagon, two-inch heels. And that day, it was pouring so hard, water's running down the sidewalk. And a bus came along, and I thought, well, free, I'm going to get on the bus and ride. And it was crowded, and I walked down the aisle and reached for the holder. And a voice from beneath me said, I don't want any whore dripping on me. And I took down and went to the back of the bus, 
totally humiliated. And I told him the other day, that's a regret I have, that I did not speak up, or better still, just shake my wet clothes on her. Yeah, you should have just dumped it. I mean, it right. you think about it now, but that was not a common experience. I, yeah. I never had any other one. But by the time I got to work at the Pentagon, I must have looked white or shaken or whatever, and the guys I worked with, you all right? What's gone? I told them. Yeah. It's yeah. a good thing they were there and not on the bus. <laughs> Because well, they were very unhappy about it. You have to it. do what my father said, consider the source. Yeah. But, you know, how yeah. dare she pick on our yeah. our jewel. So that's about... Well, what about your thoughts about just in general about where this country has come to versus 1950, 56, let's say? I want to go back. I think we all Very, do. very sad. Do you still consider yourself a, uh, yourself a patriot? Yes. Yeah, my family, mother's side, came over from Scotland just before the turn of the century, and my father's in the late 1800s. So as I said, in World War mm -hmm. II, the grandparent generation on the German side still spoke German, and my father mm -hmm. took his confirmation in German because he mm -hmm. went to a German Lutheran church. Uh, very, very much what I picture as Americans who wanted to come, who were glad to be here, wanted mm -hmm. to fit in, and are very proud that they are. And I, I think I want that instilled in my grandchildren. And we were already finding that it's countered in school. And that's very upsetting. Very upsetting, yeah. it is. Because children, children aren't gonna speak up to teachers. And no. so they no. come home and they, if you're lucky, they tell you something that's happened but well, we who are Vietnam veterans uh, particularly feel bruised when you we hear from our children and grandchildren a version of the war that doesn't fit what it, the realities were it's the whoever wrote the history mm -hmm. book or whatever professor is teaching its version of the war and it's a shame and you all had it bad to begin with because I I think of that era of uh, all the, the parading around and stuff that the hippies did, same as the group today, none of them, even in government, it seems like, have ever served. They don't have a clue, and I think they're mismanaging military affairs today. I told my husband, I don't know if I could be in because the commander-in-chief would not earn my respect or has not earned my respect. Uh, my feeling is all 18-year-olds graduating will have to do two years of some sort of government service, yeah. whether it's military, public health, Peace Corps, whatever, but that's my, that, but, we're not here about but, my but opinions. Isra but Israel is kind of goes that way. Mm -hmm. so. It does give you a different and a broader perspective. Right. It does. Right. Well, enough about my opinions. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. This is the first time I've ever had an opportunity to interview a lady who served in oh, the military. Really? Totally Absolutely. Said you get very few, but. Well, I had a lot of experience with Army nurses, I'm sorry to say, going in and out of medical facilities during Vietnam. Um, but I didn't, we didn't really have a lot of women in the military when I was in, in the Army at least. Yeah. We had some, but, but really The Nurse minimal. Corps, I think, in Vietnam was probably pretty much it overseas. They, we had what we used to call the donut dollies, which uh, were the, the Red Cross ladies yeah. that went out there and literally brought a lot of joy and, and uh, happiness and, and helped with a little homesickness to the guys in the field. So we had that, but other than that, it was, pretty much army nurses. That's, that was the military, uh, the female in the military that we ran into. So, Well, thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate it and it was very enjoyable. Thank um, him. And thank, we'll thank Tony Hilliard, the quiet one back here behind me, uh, for bringing you and, and uh, convincing you to come down here. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we stop? No, not okay. that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you.